Good morning. Good to have you with us on this cold winter day. We weren't able to meet last week, but we all met together here. And uh, for those of you that can't make it, uh, we meet together and we look at the book of Revelation. What we see this morning, last week, the next two weeks that are coming, really I'm in awe of what I see. I don't understand the pictures that I see. I don't understand the reality of what I see. It's beyond us to comprehend who God is, uh, his holiness, his majesty, all the things that are conveyed in the scriptures, especially here. We, we come to this passage and we are reminded how small we are and how great God is, and yet how much he loves us. It's a beautiful passage. We are, we are in, of course, the book of Revelation. We're in the third section together. Now John is communicating the things that are going to take place. Beginning here in chapter 4 all the way to the end of Revelation, we're going to see this now unfold, this third chapter. What we encounter last week, this week, and the next two weeks is a, is a heavenly throne room scene. Revelation 4 and 5, it's really a prequel to what's coming. It is the basis for what's coming in, in chapter 6 to follow through chapter uh, 18, 19. Uh, it, is, it is a picture, again, of the majesty of God. So we began by looking at that last week. Last week, we just looked at this emphasis, and this is going to be what's going to carry us through these next few weeks together. It's simply this, God is worthy. He's worthy of all praise. He's worthy of all glory, all worship, all honor. Uh, he's worthy to carry out in justice and in righteousness uh, what's about to unfold on the pages that will take place. God is right in all that he does. He shows us a glimpse of why that's true in, in these two chapters here. And then, we, and then we see him at work in this world, transforming this world through Christ into what ultimately will be his kingdom that will be revealed and, and, and established and set for, for all believers. And uh, so this is, this is the beginning stages of, of a massive transformation that's taking place in this world. Last week we looked at uh, eight different reasons why the Lord is, is worthy from the chapter 4. We're going to continue that thought today. Let's pick it up and, uh, and, and continue that thought. Why is, why is God worthy? Why is He able? Why is He worthy to do everything that He does and what's going to unfold? Well, in verse, in verse 4, we see this as we, as we look at that. He's surrounded by those on the throne. Uh, there are 24 thrones and 24 elders, and, and they are worshiping him. He is, he is now in the scene. He's the object of worship. He is worthy because he's, because he's worthy of all worship. He is the object of all worship. We see in chapter, in verse 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, he is being worshiped. Everyone who is present in this scene is worshiping him. That's what we see. It's, it's, it's all-encompassing. We see in verse 9 and verse 10, whenever the living creatures, the four living creatures, they give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne. Whenever they do that, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, they fall down they, before him. And who is seated on the throne and they worship him, the one who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne. And this is nothing but just a scene of, of absolute worship. All that is taking place around the throne is, is worship before our Heavenly Father. It is first and foremost the, the priority in all that's taking place. It is directed at God alone, at the Father alone. It is all-consuming, all-encompassing. We see that here. Revelation, moving ahead just to a few verses in chapter 5. John says, I looked and I around the throne, I heard around the throne, I heard around the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads, of myriads and thousands of thousands and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and they worshiped the scene that we have here in heaven in these two chapters is one of absolute worship before the lord so the question the question that comes before us and we're going to answer it from this passage we could go down a, a, a rabbit trail and never return we could go through all the scriptures and see its emphasis but we're going to look at just this passage what does it teach us about what it means to worship God, to truly worship God. There's so much right here. Let's just let's just skim the surface. Let's 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 pick up some of those gold nuggets from this passage and remind ourselves of what worship is all about. What is true worship? Well, let's see that. Well, first and foremost, we see in verses one and verses two that it is God centered. It is directed heavenward, O H I O. That's that second element of uh, that emphasis of God's word. We are to be worshipers. 
Our hearts are being directed to God and worship. It is to an audience of one. It is God the Father. When we worship, we worship one person. We worship God himself. Here specifically to the Father who is on the throne. Um, so when we worship, it is not about ourselves. Uh, thankful that we are able to enjoy that, to privilege the blessing of that. But we are worshiping him, not us. And so everything that is about a worship needs to be needs to be centered around that reality. Worship needs to be about the Lord. It needs to be about God Himself. It needs to be focused on Him. Another thing that we see here about worship is that it's it's spirit led. It's spirit driven. In verse two, we see John John just remind us, "I was in the Spirit." And that means a lot of things, but what it does mean is this: is simply the Spirit of God was in control. The Spirit of God was in charge. John was receptive to, being led by, controlled by, lifted up by the Spirit of God. We're to be the same way. When we worship, we're told in the Scriptures that true, the, the genuine worship is in, in spirit and it's in truth. When our hearts are aligned to God's because, because we are coming to Him in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, worship takes place. Worship is happening here. It is Spirit-enabled. It is Spirit-led. And when we think about worship, that principle... That requirement, that enablement is there for every believer. It is to be a spirit-led experience. We are to be, we are to be led by the Spirit to, to be able to, to come into His presence, to understand Him, to love Him, to adore Him, to, to have a, a high view of God and a humble view of ourselves. When worship takes place, we see in, in verse, verse 8, what, what's taking place in verse 8? We have the four living creatures, and it says at the end of that verse, middle of that verse, they never cease to, to worship. They never cease to say. It's unceasing. Worship, genuine worship is unceasing. It's ongoing. It never stops. It doesn't mean that we are bowed and we are worshiping with praise and, and words, and that's all we do, and that's only all that we do, and we don't function in this world, and that's not what it's talking about. It is an atmosphere of praise. It's, a, a, it's an atmosphere of the, of the presence of God. It's practicing the presence of God. God, I know you're here right now as we meet. God, I know you're here in everything that I do today. And God, I, I, and so God, I have a sense of, uh, of worship before you. As I do whatever I do today, as a believer said, a believer has this understanding, whatever I do today, however I do it, I'm doing it uh, before you. I'm doing it in your presence, mindful of your presence. I'm doing it before uh, an audience of one person. I may be trying to do a, a job that is that is good and well and pleases uh those around me and, and my boss and my employer but above that more important than that god my audience is you i'm doing it to please you to honor you it is ceaseless it is ongoing it simply is practicing the awareness of the presence of god that's what worship is in other words worship is portable it goes with us everywhere we go it's just practicing that presence of god every day and all that i'm doing another thing that we see is in verse 9 we see the we see the 24 elders they're giving honor and thanks to him who's seated on the throne. It's an expression of joy. They give glory, they give honor, they give thanks. You know, that's what worship is. Worship is joy. It is expressing joy in relationship to God, in the fact that we have relationship with God. Your, your greatest experience of worship comes out of your relationship with him. When you reflect on what God's done for you, why he did it for you, what he's called you to do and be, and to the privilege he's laid across your life and mine, when we experience uh, and understand all that we have in Jesus Christ uh, before the Father, worship becomes praise. It is a reminder to us of, of all, the, all the, the blessings, the goodness that God has poured into our life. Worship is, is just reflecting back to God. Uh, gratitude and, and praise and response simply because, because simply because we are able to enjoy God and to be in relationship to Him. That's what's happening here in this verse, verse 9. There is just an expression of of nothing but joy before the Lord. Privilege, honor, glory to God. Another element that comes out about worship, what is true worship, we see in verse 10. What did the 24 elders do? It says they fell down before him. Um, and they cast their crowns before him, and they fell down before him, and they worshiped him. And, and worship, worship is exactly what's taking place here. What's happening here, it's humility. When we worship the Lord, we praise Him, we honor Him, we exalt Him, we do all these things. But in reality, worship also humbles us. We humble ourselves before the One who is worthy. We humble ourselves acknowledging that, that He is everything. And we are nothing except what He's given to us. And so what we lay before Him is what He's given to us. How important. 
we fall down before him. When we truly worship, we, we have a keen sense that we need the Lord. We have a keen sense that we're in the presence of one who is, who is so vastly different than we are, and yet he invites us, he invites you into relationship with him, to praise him, to commune with him, to fellowship with him, to honor him, to worship him. It is to humble myself before God. That is what worship is all about. Also, we see in verse 10, we've alluded to it, is this. What do the 24 elders do? They give their crowns to the Father. They lay them before the Father. Worship is that. It's, it's, it's letting God have the most valued possession, possessions, things in my life. Whatever is in my life, I lay it back before the Lord. And I say, Lord, this is yours. Lord, he, she, they, they belong to you. I worship you for them in my life. I worship you for the influence they have in my life. I worship you. I thank you for my wife, for my husband, for my for my grandparents, for my friends. God, I, I worship you for all of these things, for what you've given to me, my possessions, my opportunities, my ministry, my testimony, all these things. But Lord, I lay all of them before your feet, that you might be in control, that you might have control. They don't belong to me, my children, my family, my friends, my job. They don't belong to me. They're gifts from you to me. What, what immense opportunity God has given to us what blessing God has given to us and as the elders are doing right here we take the things that are that are the most precious in our life and we lay them back before the Lord that's ownership we say Lord these belong to you the things in my life that I enjoy the most they belong to you first they don't belong to me they belong to you I release them I give them back to you that's worship when I worship that's what I'm doing that's what I'm expressing from my heart Worship is also just simply exalting God, God alone, putting him on the throne where he belongs, above everyone else, above everything else. These are just these are just principles that come out of this passage alone. How powerful are they? We could stop and every one we could do we could do a sermon right here just on these principles alone. But we're going to continue and keep moving. Worship is relationship, Psalm 95, verse 6. Come, let us, us, worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. It's relationship. We who have been purchased, bought, redeemed, we we have the privilege of relationship to him. We worship God the Father through Christ. Worship is relationship. We are able to worship, truly worship, because we are in relationship. Enjoy, appreciate, pursue, seek the privilege, the desire, the opportunity to worship your Savior, your God, your King. Worship is living. It's every day, it's every moment, it's every breath. We're reminded in Romans 12, 1, that we are called to be a living sacrifice. That is worship. That's our spiritual worship. We're to serve him with everything and every way to, to honor, to obey, uh, to follow after Jesus Christ. Uh, when we do that, we are worshiping our Father. We lay our life before him as the elders laid their crowns before the Lord and say, Lord, my life is you, is yours. Father, my life belongs to you. Worship is simply living. It's making choices every day, good decisions, having good relationships, setting priorities that honor the Lord, that's worship. When I do all those things for the Lord, I'm worshiping. And worship is testimony. We see this in Isaiah 12, verse 5. Sing praises to the Lord. He has done gloriously. Let this, what? These praises. Let this be made known to all the earth. Worship, when it comes out of our mouth, when we simply convey the joy and, and simply the, the positive benefits of relationship with the Father through Christ. We are expressing worship in a way that is testimony to those who are hearing it. To those who, who just like you and I, face the hardship of life and yet see us walk through that hardship, not alone, but in relationship with God the Father and the impact and the change and the result that it has in our life. Another reason that God is worthy is... And we're going to move forward here, and this is, uh, we find in chapter 6, verse 1. He's worthy because he is, he is to be served. Here we see him being served. In Revelation 6, 1, here's the verse. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. He said, Well, Pastor, that's a stretch. There's nothing about service in there. Where do you get that? Exegesis we're supposed to be all about. It's here. Who's, who's, who's acting? It's... Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. He opens the seal. Immediately, the, immediately, one of the four living creatures is at his disposal and at his command, and now is the voice 
to open up what, what Jesus Christ is going to unleash on this earth. We see in Ezekiel chapter 1, we see four living creatures there. It's not an identical one-by-one one, um, exact picture, but it's the same creatures. And what we see them is they are led by the Spirit of God. Everywhere they go, they go because they're led by the Spirit of God. I believe here it's the Holy Spirit of God. Context seems to show that to us very clearly. Verses 20 and 21 as well. And so what's taking place here is these four living creatures, their every move, their every function is in service to the Heavenly Father. Whatever He desires, they do immediately. That's worship. It is, it is service. We are called to serve Him as well. All of God's people, we see here in Revelation 11, chapter 11, verse 18, is a time for what says judging. That's, we believe that's a part of the Bema Seat and rewarding your servants. Prophets and the saints. Revelation 19.5 From the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you His servants. Great and small. We are His servants. He is being served. Daniel chapter 9, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 gives us a picture of the Ancient of Days. It's very similar to what we see right here. The Ancient of Days is God the Father. What we see is, is angels beyond number serving Him. Beyond count, serving Him. What is happening? In this heavenly scene, He is being served. Everyone who is there is serving their, Him. They are there to worship Him, to honor Him, to serve Him. When we finally meet Him in glory, we finally are transformed to be like Christ. Our every intention, our, our, our mission for eternity will be to serve the Father. We to serve our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are at His disposal for all eternity. He is worthy because He is worthy to be served. He is being served. John chapter 12 calls us to be faithful servants. We be serve Him. When we serve Him, we follow Him. That's what's happening here. He is worthy because of that aspect, that element of His worthiness to be served by all creation. He is worthy because, verse 8, we see in, in verse 8 that uh, the four creatures, as they praise Him, they say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and is to come. He is worthy because He alone is holy. He alone is holy. How significant, how important. Holy, holy, holy. It only occurs two times in Scripture. You know, we have, we have a multitude of songs that are, that are themed around this one expression right here. One of the great hymns, many of the great expressions of music before the Lord are fitted around this theme right here. Holy, holy, holy. Um, the only occurrence of an attribute of God occurring three times together, just like this. This is the height of worship that we see. Holiness simply means this. It means to be set apart. God is set apart from all of His creation. Everything that He had created, He is above and beyond and set apart from His creation. Uh, he only exists as He is. He only is holy innately. He only is holy by His very nature, His very essence. Nothing is holy unless it has been given holiness from Him. In fact, it reveals our innate nature, our sin nature, our alienation from God. We are born into sin. We're not holy. Um, we stand apart from Him. The holiness of God doesn't belong to us. It's not a part of our nature. And the only way that we can experience that is when it's given to us by God. It's attained, it's given to us, it's shared by God into our life when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. It is through His Son that we experience ultimately the holiness of God. We have a quality and attribute of God that we can't even understand apart from relationship in Jesus Christ. He is sinless in every way. He is pure in every way. Not only is He not tainted in what He does, He's, he's not tainted in any thought He has ever had. He is he's eternal, we're going to see. He's all these things, and, and throughout all eternity, He's never had a thought that is that that uh, corrupts this attribute of His holiness. What a perfect God we serve. It is, to acknowledge this, really is the highest form of worship, to say to the Lord, holy, holy, holy. It is expressing ultimately who God is. And it's, it is reminding us ultimately of, of our greatest need because of sin. We can never, we can never be in relationship to God unless God in His love provided a means, a Savior. That's what this is all about. That is worship. So we see here in Revelation 8, the four living creatures, they worship Him and they never cease to say, 
holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah 6, the only other occurrence, the same thing. The, the angels are before him. In fact, in fact, here as they are before him, they have these six wings. And notice this, two of the wings cover their face. Two of the wings cover their feet and two of the wings they fly with. It's, it's the sense of being in the very holiness of God. He, these who are, who are, who are uh, sinless, as it were, and perfect in, in creation, as it were, not a part of those angels who fell with Satan, yet are still unworthy to, to see God, and, and they cover themselves because of the purity of His holiness. That's, that's saying something very significant. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His holiness is incompatible with our sin nature, Isaiah 6. Five. When Isaiah saw this, the very presence of God, he simply said, Woe is me. He says, I am unclean. I, I live among a people who are unclean. I deserve to die because I've seen God. With my eyes, I've seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah understands the, the, the distinction between who he is and his, his inherent sinfulness and the holiness of God. The holiness of God ought to stop us in our tracks. Anytime we think about living in sin and following a habit of sin and pursuing sin in our life, it ought to stop us. Especially as believers when we are in relationship with Him and desire to be like Him. Jesus Christ is indeed our holiness. He went to the cross for that. He became sin who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, so that in Him we might become holy. We might become right with God, righteous before God. That is how we obtain the holiness of God. That then leads to what? That's worship. Peter tells us, calls us, you and I as believers, you shall be holy for I am holy. We can't do this. We can't do this. But he enables us. See, he gives us Christ. See, he gives us the Spirit of God. Positionally, in relationship, we are holy before the Lord, before the Father, because Jesus Christ, his blood, covers us for all eternity so that we can actually stand in the presence of God. We can actually be before God one day and honor Him and worship Him, bow before Him, cast our, cast our crowns before Him. In holiness we will be because of Jesus Christ. Are we sinless now? No. We are holy because of Christ. And we are to strive to be set apart for the Lord. Another reason that Jesus, the, the God the Father here, is, is worthy in every way for worship and to do what He's about to do is that He alone is mighty. We see this also in verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God all, Almighty. He is Almighty. Revelation 1.8 I am Almighty. I am all-powerful. I am omnipotent. That's what He's telling us here. He is the authority. Psalm 147 Great is our Lord and abundant in power. Job chapter 42 I know, God, that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. There's nothing that you desire to do, plan to do, commission to do that will be undone. Not one. Not one thing. Not even a, not even a, a piece of it. None of it. For you and I, it simply is this reality is that we have His power. Power surges in our life every day. Be strong, what? Be strong by pulling up your bootstraps. Be strong by working hard. Uh, be strong by doing it yourself. No, be strong in the Lord. That's the key. In His strength, in His might. See, it's with God that all things are possible. You're praying for someone. You're praying for change in your life. You're praying for an answer to prayer. You're praying for God to do a miracle. It's His might. It's His strength. You're praying for testimony, for opportunity. It's God. And so we rely on Him. God is worthy in verse 8 as well because He is eternal. Who was and who is and who is to come. That's Him. He's worthy because He's eternal. Before the mountains were, were created, before anything was created, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You know, none of us can wrap our mind around that. Can't preach it and fully understand it. I can't understand eternity, and neither can you. Everlasting, that God has never had a beginning. God will never have an end. He has always been. That's the stuff of fiction. And yet the Word of God tells us that's the stuff of truth. It is the reality of the Word of God into our life. It reminds us that God has always been. What a God He must be for that to be true of Him. When time began, before time began, where was God? There He was. In the beginning, when time began, Genesis 1-1, there was God. 
In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. When time began, there was God. He has always existed. And He gives you and I the blessing, the privilege, the opportunity. All of us are going to live for eternity. Either in relationship with God forever, blessed, or alienated from God, separated from God, cursed for all eternity. The blessing is when we are saved and receive Jesus Christ, God imparts His life into our life. God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have what? Eternal, everlasting life. Not just everlasting existence. Not everlasting punishment and condemnation and separation and alienation. And everlasting life. He is worthy because He's the giver of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. How important. And He is worthy because He created all things. Verse 11. Worthy are You, our Lord, and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for You created all things. And by Your will they existed and they were created. He created all things. There's only one Creator. Only one. Nehemiah chapter... 9 verse 6 you are the lord you alone have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their host the earth and all that is in them the seas and all that is in them and you and you preserve all of them and what what's the result and the host of heaven worships you god you made everything you made us when i receive jesus christ and i step into relationship and understand what i have in Christ and the privilege that I have now before the Heavenly Father why would I not want to worship him the only thing that would that keeps you and I from truly wanting to worship is the sin in our life is the sinful desires in our life is the control we want to have our, over our own life if we simply if we simply look at, at the Father and we simply understand all that he has given to us when we understand what he's opened up to us that was not ours could never be ours could never be our experience, could never be our hope, our promise, our future. When we understand all that God has given to us, the only response and the desire of your heart and mine as a believer who's following after Him is to worship Him. He created all things. Very clearly, we just say this. We could say more. Exodus 20, 11. He created all things and He did it in six days. Six literal days. He rested on the seventh. You know, when the authors wrote this, these, these, this concept and these verses are, are contested by many. Well, it could, mean, it could mean periods of time and all these kind of things. You know what the authors, when they wrote this, they intended, even the Hebrew authors, they, intend, they intended for the audience to simply know this. It's six days. They didn't write with ambiguity in, in their mind when they wrote. If they'd have meant periods of time or something, they wrote it differently. They very clearly, concisely wrote, he created the world in six days. What power. And then he simply rested. <clears throat> the result is Romans 11. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, he's still creating today. This creation, these heavens, these earth, the earth, that creation is finished. He rested from that on the seventh day. But he's still changing lives. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? He's a new creation. He's a brand new creation. I go from being dead to having life. I go from being alienated from God for all eternity to now being a child of God, united to him for all eternity. There has been a new creation in my life. He is creating today, and He will do that in your heart too if you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. He will change your life. Why is all this significant for us? These two chapters and, and together and, and this chapter specifically, why is it so important? Well, let's just look at a few reminders as we, as we wrap up. From what we've seen in these two chapters, He's worthy, it's significant for us because God is in heaven. It reminds us that simply this, we need a Savior. Verses 1 and verses 2. He's in heaven. John, the, the door of heaven opens. John is lifted up into the very presence of God. We cannot come before the very presence of God unless we are in relationship. John was in relationship. John knew the Savior. 
that gave him the opportunity at God's choosing and God's sovereignty and God's control to bring John in the Spirit to him. He is worthy. It's important to us because it reminds us that we need a Savior. No one, no one can go to heaven apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. No one can do this. Be before the Father unless they have put faith and trust in me. That's why it's significant. God is seated on the throne, verse 2. He is right in everything that he does. You ever find yourself just questioning God? Why he's allowed this to take place in your life? Why he allows things to happen in our culture and in our nation and around us? Why God does this and why he does that? He is sovereign and in control in all that he does. He's right in doing that. I just say this, a lot that happens in our life that is difficult is of our doing. Choices that we've made, wrong choices that we've made, sins that we've committed. But also, a lot of the difficult challenges that we face in our life, the adversity, is because of God testing us and refining us and purifying us and making us more like Him. And that's privilege, and that's honor, and that's blessing, and that'll be rewarded someday. He is worthy because He's right in all that He does. We need to be reminded of that. Why is this significant? In verse 3, he's indescribable. John can't even begin to describe him. He uses colors. He uses gemstones to describe the, the face and the features of God the Father. He's not even able to put into words what he sees. God is indescribable, and yet the blessing is this, is that God allows us to know him and to be in relationship to him. Isn't that your greatest privilege and blessing in your life, to know the Savior, to know God? That's the greatest blessing of a believer, of a child of God, is to know him. Yet, we can know Him. That's what it's all about. That's every day, that's strength. Why is this important? He is, he is the God of promise. We see the rainbow in verse 3. It's a reminder to us that God keeps His word. He keeps His word to everyone. He keeps His word to the believer. He keeps His word to the unbeliever. Whatever He has promised will take place. If I reject Him in this world, in this life, and, and stand before his presence as an unbeliever, all of God's promises to those in unbelief will be fulfilled and carried out. If I stand before the Lord covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, covered in relationship to Jesus Christ, as a child of God, all the promises that God has ever made to the children of God will take place and be fulfilled. He will keep his promises. He keeps his word. You can believe his word. You can trust his word. That's strength every day. That brings courage to do the right thing, because it'll be worth it all someday. Significance. Verse 4, he is, or number 4, he is the giver. He's the giver of all good things. Every Everything that these elders have have been given to, to them by God. The thrones, privilege, opportunity, the, the white raiments, the crowns that they give back to the Lord. It's all been given to them by God. We're blessed, folks, every day. Do you know, do you know how rich, do you know how rich your life is in blessing before God? Would, would you just stop and count all that you have in Christ? Don't count the things you have and own. Count the riches that you have in Christ. Count the intangibles that Jesus Christ has given to you, supplies to you, makes available to you every day. Count your blessings, not just the things that you see with your eyes. Count the blessings that are seen only by faith. Count what God has given to you. Be encouraged by that. Another thing is that God is terrifying in judgment. The significance to that is we are accountable to him. Uh, every day we must live with that reminder we are accountable to God. He's terrifying in judgment. We have these scenes of, of thunder and lightning and the expressions of God that will become wrath in chapter 6 and to follow, and it is terrifying. And yet for the believer, it reminds us we are accountable to Him. We have the Spirit of God in, in verse 5. It reminds us that God is the Spirit of wisdom. That's a reminder to us. It's a cause for worship. And it reminds us that we're never alone. Folks, you're never, ever alone. He uses the Word of God. God does. The Spirit of God uses His Word to bring wisdom into our life. For every moment, uh, for every day, for every challenge, He promises to supply us wisdom if we lack, simply ask. And we do lack, and so we ask. And He will give of the riches of His wisdom. <clears throat> He is peace. He is accountability. We have that sea of glass. We saw last week it was mingled with fire, the judgment of God. 
reminds us that we can and are able to experience the very peace of God. What a, what a beautiful thing. What a, what a transformative experience to know and to experience the peace of God. It passes all understanding, yet it guards our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. What blessing. God is worthy. It's significant to us because of these things. He is surrounded by worship. We saw today as we began. We are to worship Him. We are to worship Him and Him alone. No one else. He has served. We saw that in chapter 6, verse 1, and other places in Revelation, back to Ezekiel. And, of course, we could go throughout Scripture and see its emphasis. We are to serve Him, and we're to serve Him first. Before all things, He's to be our master. We can't serve what? Two masters. We have to choose who we're going to honor. We're going to have to choose who's going to be the priority in our in our in our decisions and our choices. We're going to choose who we're going to honor today, who we're going to please, who's going to have our allegiance. He calls us to serve Him. We are to serve Him. Verse eight. We are reminded that He is holy. He alone is holy. And so, with that reality, He calls every believer to be set apart to Him. He is set apart from all of His creation, but then He invites us into relationship. And He reminds us that we are now to be set apart from this world. We're to be set apart from sin, and we are to, we are to give our life to Him. We're to lay our life before Him and serve Him and honor Him and please Him and earn His favor by allowing Him to control us, to enable us, to give us the grace, extend the mercy that we need to do the right thing, to be set apart to Him. He is almighty. He is powerful. In, chapter, in verse 8 we saw, that's just the reality of this. The significance is there's not a day that goes by that God hasn't promised to you the power that you need to do the right thing, the power that you need to put a, con a, tr a control and a guard on, on the inner battles that take place that want to come out and lead and control what you do. He's given us power to overcome our thought life, it leads us into trouble. He's given us power to use our words so that we can, so we can be a testimony and, and, and a, a delight to Him. He's given us power to do the right thing, to live victoriously, that our lives might be indeed a living sacrifice, that we might be a worshiper that is, honors Him in truth and honors Him in spirit by following the Spirit of God. He is eternal. The significance of that is we are to live every day with eternity in mind. We're not living for today. We're not living for here and now. We are living with the reality that someday we're going to serve Him for all eternity. We're going to be rewarded for how well we have served Him today, now in this life. Let's do it well. Let's follow Him. Let's come to Him in prayer and say, Lord, I need you today. I need you every moment. God, give me what I need. I will use those resources by faith, I will take steps. By faith, I will obey. And He is creator of all things. Reminds us simply this, that we're precious to Him. He made you. He fashioned you in the womb. You were precious to Him before you were even born out of the body of your mother. He loves you. He made you unique. He gave you qualities that belong to you alone. He wants to use your life for Him. He wants to use my life for Him. We are precious to Him. And so we just close with, with just quick challenges. What does all this mean for us? These two, this one chapter, this expression of worship to God. Well, the significance of these things that we just saw should lead us in our life to simply say this, God, I will. I will do this. I will be this. God, I will. Not I hope to be. Not God, I want to be. I someday will be. God, I will do this. I will turn my, my eyes and my heart to you. That's verse 1. That's verse 2. I will yield to you. You're on the throne. I will yield to you. I will pursue knowing you. You are indescribable. You are unknowable. Yet you give me the privilege of knowing you. God, I'm going to pursue that. In relationship, you have given me the blessing of knowing you. God, I'm going to pursue knowing you. I want to know you. The Word of God is going to be the food of my soul. It will feed me every day so that I can know you so that it can be the grid through which I look at everything that happens in my life. I will, I will take all that happens in my life. I will filter it through the Word of God so that I can know you better. God, I will do that. God, I will trust you. If you are God of promise, I will trust you. And because I trust you, I will obey, just as Abraham did. And it was counted to him as righteousness. God, I will trust you. God, I will count my blessings. 
Everything that the 24 elders had was given to them by God. That the four living creatures had was given to them by God. Everything that we have is given to us by God. God, I will count my blessings. Uh, counting our blessings has a way of keeping praise on our lips and in our heart. It has a way of, of keeping uh, the joy of the Lord in, as a strength in our life. It has a way of, of keeping us positive every day, of being optimistic at what God is doing. It has a way of transforming how we view life and our circumstances. God, I will understand that relationship with you is privilege. It is privilege. What a delight to know you. I'll never forget that. God, I will seek your wisdom. God, and when I, and when I find your wisdom, when, I, when the, it jumps off the pages of the Word of God into my heart, I, will, now, I, won't be, I, won't be, uh, I won't be happy there until I put it into practice in my life. God, by faith, I will apply. I will live what you are showing me. God, I will learn from your Word, and then I will put it into my life so it will change me. God, I'm going to rest in your peace. God, I need your peace. I will seek your peace. God, I will, I will lay my heart before you. I will lay my circumstances before you. And I will look at your character and your promises and your sovereignty and who your love for me. And I will choose to rest in the peace that you give me through that look and that glimpse. God, I will worship you. I will truly do that. I will truly worship you with my life. God, you know my heart. I will lay my heart before you in truly worship. I will serve you. I'm going to serve you in everything. The struggle for all of us is to serve him with most things, not with everything. It's to keep a few things back to ourselves. It's to leave a part of our life untouched. And the challenge for all of us is to say, Lord, I'm going to serve you with everything in my life at all times. God, I'm going to set myself apart to you. I will set myself apart to you. Whatever the cost of that means... Whatever loss that might bring into my life that comes from people in my life or from the world around me, whatever, whatever difficulties I face because of that, God, I will choose to still honor you, follow after you, set you apart as the most important thing in my life. I will set myself apart to you because I would believe that it's worth it all. God, I will live according to your power. I won't start a day without realizing I need you. I will pray to you and talk to you in prayer because that's where power begins. I will humble myself before your word. That's where power is applied. God, I will live with eternity in mind, with a view on tomorrow, before you in your presence. And God, I will remind myself that I'm precious to you every day. These are reminders to us from this chapter. God is worthy. Not only is he worthy, he invites us and he has enabled you, if you're a child of God, into the very expression of these attributes from his, from who he is into your life. you got to remember, this glimpse that we have of the Father in chapter 4 and a glimpse of the Son of God in chapter 5, all these, all these qualities and attributes of God and who he is were attrib are attributes that are available to, the, to you and I. They are expressions that are then available to us through Christ. They are power and enablements that are enabled to us. When, when, we, when we are strengthened in a day, it's because we look at Christ. It's because we look at the Father. And what He is, what He is, He's promised to give to us. It's part, of the, it's part of the heavenly blessings, spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. The seven churches that we wrote to in chapter 2 and 3, they, they were in relationship with the Heavenly Father through Christ. And they experienced the power of these promises, of, of these qualities that we see in this chapter. They experience the promise of that and the hope that came out of that. And you and I are the same. As we go into chapter 6 and beyond, believers are going are gonna to go into the, are going to be saved in the tribulation and they will have to give their life. What would ever leave them, lead them to say it's, it's worth it to give my life and to be executed for Christ unless they first didn't have a glimpse of who God is in heaven. His promises, His attributes, His word. But whatever leads you to follow after Jesus Christ and to give up everything that's important to you, if you first didn't have a glimpse as to who God the Father was, how much He loved you that He gave His Son for you, how much Jesus Christ loved you that He gave Himself for you, unless we, unless we get to catch a glimpse of who God is, what He's done for us, then these don't become power in our life. When we catch those things and understand those things and embrace those things by faith, all of what we see here isn't just out there in another world, in another place, in another time. It is power in our life today, tomorrow, 
for every moment, for every opportunity. May God lead us as we move forward by faith, follow after him. Lord, thank you for, for all that you've done. Thank you for who you are. Bless us with your presence. By faith, may we apply that in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining with us, and we'll continue next week. Good to see you.